doing a mic check. Back. Buddy, uh, so it is 7 a.m. So we will go ahead and get started. Our speaker today is Crystal David, PharmD, BCPS. She will be speaking on quality improvement in healthcare. Our program is underwritten by an educational grant through OSU Medical Center Graduate Medical Education. A disclosure statement has been signed and is on file in the Graduate Medica uh, Medical Education Office. Dr. Crystal David is a clinical assistant professor in the emergency department of family medicine at OSU CHS. She received her bachelor's degree in secondary science education from Oklahoma State University and her doctor of pharmacy degree from Creighton University. She completed a PGY-1 pharmacy resident at the Choctaw Nation in Tallahena, Oklahoma. Her PGY-2 uh, residency was in ambulatory care at the University of Oklahoma College of Pharmacy in Tulsa, Oklahoma. As co-chair for OSU's CLER Healthcare Quality Committee, Dr. David is responsible for the yearly quality improvement and patient safety symposium. Please welcome Dr. Crystal David. Hey, thanks so much, Zach. All right, I am so happy to be here with you all today to talk about this year's um, quality improvement symposium and just about what quality improvement in healthcare is and what it means to us. So let me get my screen shared here. Are you able to see my PowerPoint okay? Yes, ma'am, we can see it. Great, thanks, Heather. Okay, so thank you for the introduction, Zach. Um, I have a few more things. I feel like it always helps me when I know a little more about the speakers. So I thought I would talk about um, myself a little bit, even though I know that's not why I'm here. Um, oh, this is the wrong PowerPoint. Okay, sorry guys. Ah, oh, bummer. Okay, so I will not be talking about myself because I did not send myself the PowerPoint. Oh, this will work. Um, so I did have some pictures of my dogs to show you. Um, how cute they are and what they do. And I was gonna talk a little bit about um, what I do in my spare time. Um, my husband and I like to travel and spend a lot of time with family. And um, of course, it's been kind of tough to do that lately. So we both have developed some new hobbies. His is, um, he built a virtual pinball cabinet, which is really cool and has like over a thousand games and he programmed it. He is very much into computer type things. And um, I have been spending the last year and a half perfecting my cookie game. So learning how to decorate cookies. And so I had a couple pictures to show you of that, but um, I guess I will just jump on into the actual presentation. Okay, so healthcare quality. Um, so what's it about? It's about making healthcare safe, effective, patient-centered, timely, efficient, and equitable so that it is um, available for all people that need it which is all of us. Um, it's important because we want to help improve patient care, address barriers to care, make sure that we are following national guidelines and um, part of your residency is, is required. So I do believe that all residency programs are required to, like as a resident, you're required to participate in um, at least one quality improvement project during your time. And excitingly, you can also win some money. So. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the symposium if you're not familiar with it. This year we'll be doing our fifth annual resident and fellow quality improvement and patient symposium. It will be on May 17th, 2022, which sounds like a long ways away, but we all know that May will be here before we know it. So we're not 100% sure what the format will be. The last two years we have had it virtually. And so what it has looked like is that um, basically our posters have been presented and <clears throat> kind of like published online for everybody to see. We have judges from all over the consortium. And um, let's see, we've had judges from the Cherokee Nation, the Choctaw Nation, we have nurses, we have people from OSU and lots of different programs across the consortium. And they will um, have access to the posters before the publishing date. And they can email the authors and ask questions and kind of get um, some feedback from the authors to see what's going on. And then they'll judge based on a rubric. And then we compile all of their scores and then we will have a first, second and third place winner. And so then after we know who the winners are, we will mark those on the website and then publish the website so that everybody can see it. 
And so it's great to show everyone like what kind of quality improvement we are doing within, um, within our consortium. So the couple years before that, so the first and second year, they were actually in person. And so we would print out the posters and have it here at OSU Medical Center. And so the authors would be there with their poster in more of a typical poster symposium type fashion. The judges walk around, ask questions, and then, um, and then so can anybody else who's interested in the posters. And so depending on what everything looks like this year, we may have like a hybrid of the two. I think that the online aspect is not going to go away because we've had some really great success with that and a lot more involvement. So last year, these are the winners that we had. Um, our first place winners were um, from the emergency medicine department here at OSU and their team won $300. Our second place was from the Choctaw Nation in Tallahena and they won second place. And then our third place poster was from um, med family medicine here at OSU and they got a third place. So you think, okay, well, you know, hundred bucks divided a couple ways, but to tell you, one of the residents was like, yes, instead of eating cafeteria lunch, I got Lone Wolf and a cookie. So, you know, there are um, some benefits to winning the money. I don't know what the $300 people did with their money. Okay, so if we're talking about quality improvement, there's a lot of different models. And today I'm gonna focus on what's called the model for improvement. And as Zach told you, I am, my background is high school science teacher. So I'm kind of cheesy about some things. But I created this, I needed the visual, I like visuals, anyway. I created a QI roadmap for us. And there are gonna be some mile markers we're gonna talk about today and what we do at each mile. So for mile one, we're gonna come up with ideas. So we all know what ideas are, but in the context of quality improvement, what are ideas? And so we need to be thinking about what changes we can make that will result in an improvement. And to do that, we need to understand the current situation. We need to figure out what are some barriers we might have. We need to identify and prioritize these change ideas. And to do that, you know, it's really helpful to brainstorm. And in family medicine didactics a couple of weeks ago, we did some brainstorming and coming up with ideas for our program. Um, there's some other brainstorming ideas that I've read about called role storming, which I think is kind of a cool idea. So instead of just thinking about it from my perspective, like, okay, as the pharmacist, of course, I'm always coming up with ideas like, okay, we could track this medicine, we could look at this dosing, right? And so it's really easy to be like stuck in our roles. But when you roll storm, you take on the idea of somebody else. So you might be roll storming from the patient perspective. So walking through how a patient goes through things and thinking about where would they see benefit? Or maybe you're gonna roll storm from um, the perspective of your customer service representative in your clinic or roll storm from the nursing perspective or the respiratory therapist. So thinking about from a different perspective, what are some ideas? And I think it just kind of helps us step out of our own space and think about things in a different way. So when you're choosing your project, really you know, think about like, what are some gaps between what you want to be doing and what you're actually doing? And I think the longer we are in our, in our roles doing what we're doing, it's kind of hard to remember, what did I really want to be doing? what I think it was gonna look like when I got here. And so sometimes having those fresh ideas from um, the new residents or from students can be really helpful. Like, oh yeah, that's what we really wanted to be doing here. Why aren't we doing it that way? And kind of thinking about how we can make that happen. Also think about like, are there any standards that aren't being met, right? So we know that in all treatment aspects, there's different standards to be looking at. And then because this is like a one year project, really it's not gonna be a year long. Think about is there anything we can do that will show results in three months, right? Because May's gonna be here, but you have to think of your ideas, you have to form your team, you need to implement the plan, then you need to come up with your poster and then your results. And so it doesn't have to end in three months, but can you show some results in three months so that um, you have something to present in the end? I put a couple of posters up here for you to look at. These are from a couple of years ago. And I did realize these are all family medicine posters, so I apologize, but it's probably because I was doing this for a didactic for them. But so they did quality maintenance with low dose CT scans that you can kind of see here. Um, nothing fancy, this is something we can all create. Improving documentation of blood product consent in the outpatient setting. 
increasing pneumococcal vaccinations in the OSU family medicine clinics. Um, but all of the posters from the last, I believe, four years maybe, are all online um, on the CLEAR website and they're in our handbook that you'll be getting. And so you can go and look through everybody's posters and get some ideas and see like what other people have done in the past. All right, so once you have some ideas and you think about what you wanna do, our mile marker two is making an aim statement. So our aim statement is really important because it's gonna help focus our project. So basically, what are we trying to accomplish? What's that problem you want to address? Be thinking about these things when you're writing your focus aim statement. What is the overall goal? And when you're writing an aim statement, you're gonna start with a verb, right? So things like increase or maybe improve, reduce. So thinking in these contexts to try to come up with our statement and our focus goal for the project. And when you're coming up with this, it's really helpful to like ask all the questions, right? So I don't know what grade it was. Was it like fourth grade when we learned all the who, what, when, where, why, how, questioning type things, maybe before then, I don't know. Um, but that's what you're gonna think about. Like, okay, who is the target population? Um, what are the measurable goals we're gonna be looking at? When do I need to have it completed? Let's have a timeline. One thing I see uh, most often is people don't have a timeline. They just start doing stuff. And then they don't know, am I on track? Am I not on track? Oh, hey, it's May 1st and I don't have anything done. Ah, right. So have a timeline in the handbook that we um, that we have that we'll give you all. We have a sample timeline for you. And so you obviously don't have to use that timeline, but use that to think about these are the benchmarks that need to be completed. And this is like a reasonable time frame to have them completed to be in the end. So I believe that um, we'll have the handbook updated and ready for you all probably um, in the next month or so, um, but it'll come through to you via email. Um, ask yourself, like, why is this important? And then also, how will this be carried out? So when you're thinking about these goals and this target, you know, you really want to go back to this um, thing called the SMART, right? We want your goals to be SMART, where S is like specific, M measurable, A attainable or achievable, and then R would be like realistic, relevant, timely. So we've all seen this before. But these are like things to keep in mind when you're writing your own aim statement. Oh, there they are. There you go, time-based. Okay, so I put up some sample aim statements here for you. You can see that this one starts with that verb, right? They want to reduce. What do they want to reduce? Adverse drug events, okay? Who is the population? Critical care patients. How much? 75% and in what timeline? So within one year. Now, of course, this would not be a great timeline for us, for our projects, but um, maybe you have an overall project for a year, but we're gonna look at three months of it, like that kind of thing. So you're gonna have some progress in three months. So it's okay to do this as a long-term project and then report back on a portion of it. Okay, so another sample aim statement. Improve, there's your verb, right? What are we gonna improve? Medication reconciliation, okay. What kind of medication reconciliation? At transition points. So it's kind of vague, right? Are we talking about um, admission medication reconciliation or discharge or what? But um, it's an idea. By how much? 75% within what timeline? One year. Okay, here, achieve more than 95% compliance with on-time prophylactic antibiotic administration within one year. And of course, obviously within the poster and within the project, you would um, identify a little bit more about what you would mean by um, prophylactic antibiotics. Are we talking about in surgery? Are we talking about um, in sepsis? That kind of thing. Well, I guess that's not prophylactic, but um, you would define what you would do. Okay, so that is our mile marker two. So then we would move on to mile marker three. So mile marker three is looking at our measures. And so measures are obviously important to be able to look at what we are doing. How are we going to know that our changes are actually an improvement? We can make changes all day long, but if we don't know if it's improving anything, it's not really all that meaningful to us, right? We can't just say, oh yeah, I feel like things are better. I mean, sometimes that's really helpful, right? But really we know that we need to have some more concrete ideas. So some considerations would be Okay, what are my outcomes? What are the ultimate results we're looking at? And you'd also wanna look at your process, right? So what 
you want to do to achieve your outcome. So these things have to be thought about so you can know which measures you're going to look at. So I was thinking about some of the measures that would be available to us through like reports in EPIC. And of course, this is just a small sample of what they are. And you can see probably they're from a pharmacist perspective, but um, we can look at medications that are being prescribed. We could look and ask for reports about culture results. We could be having reports from different lab results. Maybe you could pull reports by diagnosis code or even things like was a vaccine given or not given. So there are all kinds of reports that we can have pulled. And I'm sure that, I mean, this is literally just five of very many that could be done. But I just wanted to get you thinking about some of the things you could ask for. Okay, so after we know what measures we wanna get and figure out how we're gonna be able to get those, right? We don't wanna start our project if we're not gonna be able to get those results. And then we're gonna to want to do mile marker four, which is test our project. Okay, so when we're thinking about testing, like I said, like remember this is kind of a short project. You wanna keep your changes small and then you wanna study the results after each change. So maybe this is something that you wanna keep doing year after year. We make a change, look at the result, make a change, look at the result and kind of go from there, right? And so we'll talk about what that kind of looks like toward the end of this presentation. Um, after we've tested it, then mile marker five is really important, right? Like we need to spread and sustain it. And so um, if we're not telling people what we're doing and people don't know these changes and can look at it like, oh, can I do this where I am too? Or how can we now make this really part of our workflow? Then it's not as helpful. So spreading and sustaining would be including like hardwiring it into our health system. So if there's some alert that you found, it's gonna be super helpful in helping us um, always make sure we do X, Y, or Z. How can we get that in the whole system here? How can we get that in the hospital or in our clinic? Um, including all your staff. So educating everybody that is involved with what this new idea is going to be, communicating it, and then just continuing to measure and monitor, making sure like, okay, this is doing what we thought it was going to be doing. Um, and then another way you can spread and sustain is to present your findings at our annual resident quality improvement and patient safety symposium, right? So like you can share this information with all of the consortium and it'll be public on the website for other people to see. Other things I know like in family medicine, we always present our findings at our department meetings so everybody can see what we did. And then you can even publish your findings in a journal. Um, especially like we've had some really successful projects in the past. So uh, I think like this is something that is probably not looked at often enough. Um, also, I believe um, the symposium winners have an opportunity to apply to get funding to present their poster at a conference like outside of the OSU consortium. So there's a lot of great opportunities out there to spread the ideas that you have um, done in your QI project. Okay, so that is our roadmap for getting through a QI project. Um, another way that a lot of people look at these projects is called the PDSA cycle. So I kind of alluded to that a few times, but I wanted to um, look at it here again, just for everybody, right? So PDSA stands for plan, do, study, act. So it's this cycle, you're gonna do it, make some changes, look at it, go again. And I wanted to put this in the context of those mile markers I made up. So your plan is really like the first three mile markers, right? Um, this is where you're going to define the nature of your project. You're gonna identify people, time, and resources that are needed. Look at that problem you wanna solve, figure out how you are going to measure it, right? Define your, your metrics, collect your baseline data, and this is where you would get your IRB determination. Your do would be mile marker four, so you're gonna test it, right? If there's any training that needs to be done, do that. Make sure you're communicating with your team. Monitor those metrics, but don't prematurely analyze them. And then the S is study, which is mile marker four. So test, look at that data. Has there been an improvement? What did you learn? Can, you, um, can what you found help you make a different change? And then the mile marker five is the act portion of it, right? So making sure you're hardwiring it into your system 
see what you found. Can you start a new PDSA cycle? Like continuously using these little small sets of changes can be really powerful in making a big change in um, what you're doing. So um, let's see, we had, I think like 25 people or 25 different posters last year. And um, like I mentioned, you will be getting a handbook that'll kind of detail some of this to you. But what I found is, um, in my experience, uh, people are emailing me a lot, asking me questions about the posters. And a lot of that information is found in the handbook. And I don't mind answering those questions, but I thought that I would walk you through some of this um, today, just to kind of like preemptively let you get an idea of what to expect. And um, maybe you've never created a poster before, you know? So I just wanted to go through what a poster would need and like what would make it um, a good poster. So when we're looking at these posters, um, basically I wanna talk about the content. So all posters are gonna have a title. I think that's pretty obvious, but just so you know. Um, you wanna list your authors. And so this is where sometimes um, people forget to include their faculty advisor and their credentials. Okay, and then all the other authors, right? So if you have nurses who have been working on this project with you, make sure you're putting their name and credentials. And if you're a resident, we want your PGY status on the poster. Include your institutional affiliation. And then on the poster, you need your logo. So if you are an OSU program, you just need the OSU logo. If you are outside of the actual, like if you don't for like Cherokee Nation, for example, you want you can put your Cherokee Nation logo on there, but then you also do need the, the most current OSU logo on your poster. And then just making sure you have some kind of logical sequence of information, right? People are going to be reading this, so they're going to look down and across, right? So you want that to flow. Okay, you don't want just a bunch of words. So just like when you're making a PowerPoint, you know, you want to have some visuals on there. So depending on your project, these visuals can be different, but maybe you have some photographs. We had some last year, they were doing sim labs. And so they had some cool photos of what they were doing. Put some graphs on there so we can easily see your data, some tables, some charts, some things with some color, things that break up that text and help somebody who's reading this poster to easily say, oh, I can see their data and I understand it. Make sure that each section is concise and clear, right? You don't need paragraphs after paragraphs of information. This isn't a report, this is a poster. So you want to um, take snippets. It can be bulleted, there can be sentences, but it needs to be concise and clear. You do not want to put abbreviations on there because um, people may not know what they mean. And then here is one that gets left off all the time. Every poster should have references, right? You're going to have a background section and it, it's stuff that you have researched. And so you need to cite these references on your poster. And then before you turn in your poster, this should not be the first time when they get on the website, your faculty advisor shouldn't be like, oh yeah, that's what their poster looks like, right? So make sure you're reviewing this with your faculty advisor um, along the whole way for sure, but before you submit your poster as well. Okay, so there are different sections on the poster. And the first section would be like your background information, right? So this is like your introduction. And it's going to provide the reader uh, like a short background of like what you're doing. And then they're going to, what you're going to be discussing, what you're going to be presenting. They need to be able to like quickly understand why you chose this topic, right? So not a whole bunch of paragraphs, but really like why is it important? And here's really where most of your references are going to come into play, right? You're not going to have a lot of references on your, um, your results and your conclusions, right? That's your stuff. But your background, your introduction section is where you're primarily going to be having those references. So the first section is top left, right? Your background. Then you're coming down your poster. That's where you're gonna see your aim statement, right? And so this is typically just like one sentence or a very quick blurb about your aim. And this is gonna include that goal of the project and making sure that you have like specific information about your aim like we talked about in uh, the previous slides. Then the next section is your methods. Okay, here is what we did. Here is how we made changes. Here is how we collected data, right? So depending on your project, you're gonna have maybe some qualitative or descriptive information and then quantitative, like how you got those results. So it's not the results, I can see that might be confusing here, but how you got those results. And then the next section is actually results, right? 
And so this is where you're going to want to use figures and graphs and tables so you can easily identify what information you're trying to give to your audience, not just a bunch of text. Conclusions is your next section, right? You're going to discuss the relevance of your findings. Put in any limitations in there. You know, like if you, man, this isn't, we didn't think it was going to go this way. Here are some limitations we found. Sometimes that's just as important as what went well, right? So you know, like how to address this problem in the future. Or if somebody else is also thinking about doing something like this, they can say, oh yeah, that would be a limitation for me doing this in my um, area as well. But talk about what went well, talk about those limitations, right? Um, and then also very importantly, our next steps, because mostly this is gonna be kind of a cycle, right? Like, what am I gonna do now that I have this information? How is this going to change? And so definitely include that in your poster. And then, like I mentioned before, do not forget your references. Remember, these are being judged and there's a rubric and there are points for these things. And that's why I'm bringing them up. Okay, um, I wanted to share with you some of the poster templates that are available. This link is in the handbook that you will be getting from us. Um, and so you don't have to create this from scratch. So it's great. There are already templates out there for you to use. And so here's one that um, I downloaded from the library website, right? So you can see it's gonna have all the sections that you need and you would just go in. So this is a PowerPoint slide. You go in and just edit it, edit those sections, obviously change your graphs, but you can see this one's kind of busy with all the different um, graphics on it, but they're trying to show you what are some of the different visuals you can use um, in your poster. And then here is another one that they created. And so you can see it has like Crystal Peep there in the background, an introduction section. So their objectives is like their aim statement. And you can leave the word objective and put your aim statement there. Methods, results, so you can see it goes down and then kind of over, right? So the next section is results. And then the next section is your conclusion. And then the bottom right is where you would put those references. Okay, so now what are some of our next steps for this project? And really right now it's like coming up with an idea, right? Like what am I gonna do? So this next slide is a little busy, but I went through um, from our handbook and put up here the OSU Medical Center, like the clinical sites are quality priorities. So you can look through this list and see, are any of these interesting to you? Are these things that you have some ideas on how we can improve this at OSU? Of course, I know you're not all at OSU. And so I would just um, encourage you to talk to your quality department where you are and see, because I am quite certain they will also have a list of some quality priorities that they would love to talk to you about and think about like how you can um, create this project to help your institution meet quality goals that have already been set. And um, so come up with your idea, form a team, right? You don't want like 12 people on your team necessarily, but you do want to have like a tight knit group that has good experience. So if you're doing something with um, check-in at your clinic, I would include a PSR in your team because they know more about the check-in process than you do. Um, if you're doing something um, with, let's, let's go back to this idea, um, antibiotic stewardship, you know, you might include the antibiotic um, pharmacist, or you might try to include whoever is on um, the stewardship team at your institution. Patient experiences, you want to bring a nurse in perhaps. Anyway, so there's lots of ideas. And so we want to make this team interprofessional, right? So think outside of just your like two best friends in your program. Um, how can you make this like a richer, better experience and to get as much information as you can? You do have to have a faculty advisor. So find somebody that you know would be interested in what you are doing. And really the most important thing is like, just get started, right? If you don't ever get started, you are never gonna finish it. So get started on something and learn. And if you've never done a quality improvement project before, then maybe this will just be um, your experience for like, oh, okay, this is what it's like. So next year I can really do X, Y, Z. And um, you know, not only is this a requirement for, I believe most of the residency programs, but depending on what board certification you get, um, you can do a quality improvement project once you know you're out in the real world. And it can count for your, um, like for different 
parts of your um, recertification. And so I know we were talking in family medicine, and I think there's like different modules you can do that cost like 400 bucks or something like that. So instead of that, you can do a quality improvement project and submit your findings, and that counts for that. And I'm, I apologize because I don't know all the right lingo for that. Um, but it can save you money once you're out of here, once you know how to do it. And not only that, you're improving your patient care and outcome. So I came up with a few tips and tricks. And um, before you get too excited, they're not all that amazing, but I was just trying to think of things to help you through this process. And really the number one thing is utilize that handbook that you're gonna get. If you know it comes mid-October and you are trying to do this with your team and you're like, I never got that handbook, reach out to me and we'll make sure you get it. it just must have somehow not gotten to you in um, you know, trickles down, so we'll see. But in that handbook, there are links to those templates. There's a poster checklist, right? There are all kinds of things. And we talk about like how to do research in that handbook. Um, create a timeline. I can't emphasize this enough. We talked about it already, but have this timeline that you're going through so that you can checkpoint. Oh man, we have not done this yet. And now it's January. And then this year, I'm gonna try using something called Asana. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it or not, but it's basically a project management tool and you can use it by yourself. But if you share like an email ending, so everybody has a .osu or yeah, osumc.net or okstate.edu or cherokee.org, whoever's within your organization, you can share projects together. And so for my quality improvement that I'm on this year, I'm gonna create this Asana account and then um, you create your timeline when things are due and you can assign it to different people who have also signed up for that. And you can all look at that calendar like independently and be like, okay, well that's due and John was supposed to do that. I wonder if he's done it yet, let me check in on it. And um, so that kind of keeps everybody accountable and they can see like, oh man, I have to do this part before so-and-so does this part. So there's a lot of accountability there. And then present your poster, right? So even if you don't get to the end and get findings, maybe some things happened, you had a lot of barriers, but you have this idea, you have your aim statement, you know how you want to do it, you don't really have any results yet, you can still present your poster and then next year continue on or even this year after the symposium continue on with your project. But it's still good to like share those ideas with others and you know maybe even win some money. All right. So that is the end of my presentation. And if y'all have any questions, um, I can take those at this time. Or if anybody wants to share their experiences from past quality improvement symposiums or projects you've done. Anybody? Okay, well, if you do think of questions later, um, feel free to email me, crystal.david at okstate.edu. Um, I am very willing to help you, and I have a great team of people who help me with the symposium. It's a lot of work, and there is no way I could do it on my own, and they definitely help out and know so much. So we can answer your questions. We can help, help you with anything that you're struggling with. Hey, Dr. Dave, you did a great job. Thank you. I also wanted to introduce myself, Dr. Cook, that I'm a resource that you guys can utilize as well for faculty advisors or actually getting faculty advisors for your um, projects or if you if you want ideas to talk about with whatever committees you might be on, things like that. So feel free to reach out to me as well. Yeah, thank you so much. All right, so I guess, Heather, are we, are we finished?